Vsauce, I'm Jake, and being able to go from one point in three-dimensional space to another is an incredibly cool concept, and a major mechanic in the game series Portal, where you use wormholes as a means to physically connect two different locations. Unfortunately, that isn't yet possible. A wormhole is a hypothetical shortcut through space-time, and one that requires negative energy to create. However, we would first have to figure out how to create negative energy, which is also hypothetical. But that shouldn't stop us from thinking with portals, so let's start with what a portal is. A portal is defined as an entrance or doorway. They are gateways into different places, into new experiences and new worlds. When you were a kid on the playground, if someone said the ground was lava, the ground was lava. You had entered the magic circle. Extra Credits has a great video about it, but imagine you're on a soccer field, or in a classroom, or in a court. In those places, different rules apply than in normal life, and we accept them. The same goes for movies, books, and video games. While playing Metal Gear Solid, there was a moment when a character died that actually made me tear up. It was the first time I had cared so deeply about a video game character, a mesh of polygons. And it got me thinking about how we connect to fictional characters. In Frank Rose's great book, The Art of Immersion, he mentions an experiment by former game designer Demas Hassabis, in which he took patients suffering from a disease that affects memory and had them imagine laying on a beach. One of the subjects could see the color blue, hear birds, the sound of the ocean, and some ship horns. That was as much as he could imagine. A control subject, someone with the full capability of their memory, was asked the same thing, and they described the sun, the sand, the heat, the color of the sea, and they saw palm trees lining the beach. What Hassabis discovered was that our memories help us form our imaginations. They're what allow us to integrate naturally with imagined settings. His overall goal was to form a model of human brain function, enabling game designers to make characters with emotions, memories, and thoughts, to create an intelligent artificial intelligence. It's the reason why a game like The Sims was so revolutionary. It felt like the characters, The Sims, had virtual free will. We'd place them in a world that we helped shape, but we never knew the exact outcome the game would act as a portal to an alternate version of our own reality, one that we felt we had more control over. When you enter a virtual world, an important aspect that keeps you engaged is the illusion of choice. That decisions you make will affect the outcome of the game, even though in reality it's already been pre-programmed, even if it has multiple endings. The Stanley Parable does a great job of making the illusion of choice a centerpiece in the game, and then mocking it. Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't five years ago. One of the reasons multiplayer games like Counter-Strike or World of Warcraft are still so active is because the characters you are playing against are people. Completely unpredictable people. Oh my god, he just ran in. There's always been that instinctive urge, that desire to live inside the fictional worlds of books we've read, movies we've watched, or the virtual ones of games we've played. And faster than ever before, technology is getting us there. The Oculus Rift allows us to explore the boiler room from Spirited Away, be teleported to the bustling streets of Tokyo, or maneuver your way through City 17 and Half-Life 2, all without leaving your home. This is so cool. Even when we're being passive and watching content on television, the experience is becoming more immersive. Samsung was the first to create curved ultra-high-definition televisions, displaying images four times that of HD. The first time I watched a movie on one, it felt like looking through a window. And right now, you are staring at the biggest portal imaginable, the internet. You can start on the Wikipedia page for Jelly Donut, and four link clicks later, end up on the meaning of life. You can go on Reddit and explore what fictional worlds people have made in the world-building subreddit. You can go to college, watch pretty much any movie, read any book, and if there is a story you wish existed, there's probably fan fiction for it, or an epic rap battle. And with this incredible portal we have now, we are spending more and more time in virtual reality. We interact virtually, we shop virtually, and we live virtually, or at least part of us does, and we also consume a lot more information than we ever have. There are people that will say that we spend too much time playing video games or on computers, and in the 19th century, people had the same exact fears about reading too many novels. In America in the 1940s, people would gather and burn comic books. 
Even in 1605, the character Don Quixote filled his imagination to bursting with everything he read in books that it became the literal truth, which led to him thinking he was a knight and jousting windmills. So what is the next progression for immersion? Well, it may be brain-computer interfacing. Jan Shoreman is a quadriplegic who had electrodes injected into the parts of her brain that activated when she thought of moving her arm and shoulder. Those signals were sent directly to a robotic arm, allowing her to control it. Once we can tap directly into our minds and have our sensory inputs feeding into a computer, you could visit Mars without ever needing a spaceship. When you'd open your eyes, you'd be seeing the red planet. When you wanted to walk, you'd just think it and your character's legs move. The same would go for exploring virtual worlds. And as we spend more time in these worlds, they start to bleed into our own. If I were to ask you right now to write from memory a paper on the history of Batman and a paper on the history of Einstein, which do you think would be longer? Which would have more detail? If I were to tell you that Batman's name was Jim Wayne, his parents died in a car accident, and his Batcave was in a Taco Bell, you would tell me I'm wrong. Because there are things you know about Batman, things that are truths. Just like I'd be wrong if I told you that Einstein had long black hair and lived in an RV. If we can argue about a fictional character's history or traits, does that, in a sense, make them real? I've surprisingly never met Abraham Lincoln, but I've read about him in books, and I've seen him portrayed in movies. I've also never met Luke Skywalker, but I've read about him in books and seen him portrayed in movies as well. In fact, the Star Wars wiki for Luke Skywalker has 42,000 more words than the wiki for Abraham Lincoln. But we know that Abraham Lincoln existed. So then I'd say, how do we know that Luke Skywalker never existed? Sure, I've never met anyone that's met Luke Skywalker, but there's nobody alive that's ever met Abraham Lincoln. All we have of them are stories. And on that point, how do you know that I exist? What you're watching right now is a bunch of code being interpreted by a machine to display an image. If some of the code gets deleted, I become corrupted. Sure, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, but you can also follow Betty Draper, a character from Mad Men on Twitter. Have you ever met me? Have you seen me in real life with your own eyes? You fill in who I am by what you know of me, by what you've seen of me, and by your own experiences and memories to create a full picture. You have gone through a portal and entered my world, and in this world we have a magic circle that you accept as true. And it isn't until we pull back that you get the full picture, that this whole entire time I've just been a recording on a television screen. And as always, thanks for watching.